so for anyone who who has been watching us or listening to us for a while, you know that I I already went uh, through a move once. I I moved from Texas to LA. Then after you, some time out there, yeah, <laughs> um, I really miss Legabe. He just. <laughs> He, uh, he wasn't afraid to be himself, you know, and now no. I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting on the floor of my new apartment, <laughs> getting ready, getting ready to, um, to talk about uh, one of two movies named Leatherface. In this case, this is Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, not to be confused with Texas Chainsaw 3D. Which is a, technically a sequel? But not the second direct, one. Direct. It's a direct sequel to yeah. the original, um, sort of like the movie that we are about to talk about, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Three, because that is yeah. also a sequel to the first one, presumably ignoring Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two. Yeah, it it at the very least it acknowledge it does not acknowledge what happened in Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two, um, which is I mean it barely opinion, but. It barely acknowledges the first movie. How do how, how do we even get into this film? Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw 3, not to be confused with either Leatherface or Texas Chainsaw 3D. Yeah. I mentioned this to you off air, but somehow this franchise has a, a worse problem with titles than the Halloween movies. Yeah, yeah I don't know when you have that kind of stiff competition from a series that you know stole their names for several of their films from the pink panther movies uh and you're not doing as well as them i think you're in trouble um it's i mean it's all over the place just like the franchise i mean the movies uh and and the things that they play off of are so all over the place <laughs> that uh you know e even just talking about this movie has the potential to confuse us and and get us talking about different aspects of of different movies in this franchise the one that came after it the ones that came before it uh it's it's just a bit of a mess um I, I do want to address I... the elephant in the room, though, uh, <laughs> because last time we were on this channel, this was not what it looked like. This is not what the name uh -huh. was. Uh, we've <laughs> we've been doing Patreon episodes as we prepared for what this not that bad looked like moving forward. Uh, we hope everybody looks or likes uh, the new look of everything so far. Obviously, uh, same logo, same us, uh, different everything else. <laughs> um, new day uh, that we're releasing these. Fridays is the day for not that bad from this point moving forward. And we got a technically a new home uh, here on the That Bad Media channel after we went through our rebrand. Yeah, here. a new home, a new residency, um, yeah. a new coast for me. And yeah. now finally, Connor and I are on the same coast, the East Coast. Thank God uh, that will work wonders for our scheduling, folks. <laughs> Don't want to peek behind the curtain too much here, but Jesus, I am very happy about this. So, uh, like you said, it's difficult to find a spot to sort of poke the skewer in to talk about this movie. Uh, I, I want to bring up something first, though. Uh, what is your familiarity with this and, and sort of your feeling about the franchise as a whole? Because Te Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a little... Um, it can be divisive for some horror fans. I mean, uh, it, I, in my opinion, disrespected at times uh, past the first film. So uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the franchise? Maybe and even sometimes the, f the first film. Uh, I mean, there, yeah. there are skeptics out there. So this is actually the first time we're talking about this franchise um, on the main channel. We have talked about another yes. Texas Chainsaw Massacre film um, on our Patreon. We talked about the prequel. Not Leatherface, the prequel to the original <laughs> film. Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, the prequel to the, to remake. the remake. Yeah. Uh, not, not, not the reboot that came out from <laughs> Netflix. No, the remake of the first the Remake film. starring Jessica Biel. So yes. Uh, let's actually just kind of lay out our thoughts on this franchise. Now, I've alluded to this probably, but the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, the original, is a sacred movie to me. It, uh, it's, it was a formative viewing experience the first time I saw that. Uh, it rocked my world. It's one of the only movies to not only truly disturb me, but left me speechless. At that point... I had been growing up on monster movies, like uh, hammer horror movies. So this was, I think, my introduction into, you know, that adult world of, of you know, 
more hardcore horror, uh, dangerous horror, and and was really a gateway for that. So it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I know some people complain that it's dated or that uh, some people I've heard call it a fluke. Uh, Ooh. Because they they think that Toby Hooper is is not worthy of the title Master of Horror. Ugh. Without getting into that too much, uh, I just couldn't disagree more. I think uh, it, it <laughs> the fact that they keep going back to the well of this franchise, despite all of the bizarre starts and stops they've had at um, at making it into a franchise, is a testament to the to the staying power. Of that original film yeah uh, so that's the first movie and from there we have a true choose your own adventure not just in storylines but tones uh, you know directions characterizations um it, it's crazy because even when they had a true hit on, like a true hit on their hands with the remake they yeah. couldn't even they couldn't even capitalize off that there was the prequel and then it really petered out from there so uh the question is can, could this have been a franchise? Because this movie we're about to talk about, Leatherface, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, was <laughs> uh, very much an attempt to turn it into a slasher franchise akin to Freddy and Jason and, and Michael. Yeah, and I think from this point, we should just refer to this as part three. Uh, I know yeah. it's technically not part three. I think this is going to be easiest for us to reference. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, man. This this is a, this is a... This franchise is a tough one to talk about. I think for any horror fan who enjoys this franchise, especially as much as I do, it's a difficult one to talk about because on one hand, uh, I love this franchise. Like I love it so much. Uh, I, it's not held as as high for me as like you know a, a Halloween or a Nightmare on Elm Street, but I'd put it on par for me probably with Friday, uh, if not slightly ahead of it in some ways. Um, and that's uh, uh, sacrilegious in the horror community. You're but talking I, about the franchise, the franchise or the original as a whole. movies. Yeah, the franchise, franchise as a yeah. whole. Now, original movie for sure. Uh, can't touch it. I am a, I'm an infamous original Friday the Thirteenth hater. Uh, in a way of <laughs> saying it's it's not a terrible movie, but it is not what people say it is. I, I think we should just dive into this movie. Uh, just talking a little bit of background. I don't want to bore the people with it. Um, but this movie was released in 1990, directed by Jeff Burr, who would go on to do Pumpkinhead 2. Um, Rest in peace, by the way. New Line Cinemas commissions, you know, they buy the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because they, you know, A Nightmare on Elm Street had more or less run its course. They wanted a new franchise. And they tried yeah. to do that a few times with a few different <laughs> characters. Yes, they did. Uh, mostly to tragic results. But they hired uh, Jeff Burr, who was, you know, he was a B-movie director. Uh, he said he was the 50th person offered the job and <laughs> I believe he was fired at some point and had to be rehired because nobody would would direct this damn thing. You know, Peter Jackson was was offered this job um, and had he accepted it, I guess this would have been his first time working with Figo Mortensen. Yeah, that's an inch. Th this is also the first, uh, if I'm not incorrect this is kind of the first texas chainsaw massacre movie of two i guess <laughs> that would uh that would feature an actor who would eventually this would not be the cause of their rise to fame uh, but it no. would be a stepping stone uh in their rise to what they would later become of course the next film would do so with matthew mcconaughey uh this one with and, and renee zellweger and renee Obviously. zellweger uh, yes absolutely so we start of course on a on a road trip um a road trip that is so awkward that I would have to imagine that Leatherface was a was a relief <laughs> from. <now. laughs> um, Can you clarify this for me? So it's a road trip between um, this couple. I think they're together. They're still together. Yeah. They're, so they're together but, for now. She is going away at some point, and they are not going to be together when she goes away. And the 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 insinuation is that he doesn't trust that they will get back together when she comes back. Uh, and she is just saying she needs some time away. Um, truthfully, unimportant to the plot of the movie. <laughs> yeah, she needs time away from this guy, which is why they're taking uh, a road trip from California to Florida. You know, taking a road trip is, is a classic setup, uh, and it's not one that I'm going to shit on for being too cliche, but you, you got to do more to let us know what is the significance of this trip. It's sometimes screenwriters really confused, like, 
arguing for drama. So yeah, they think that we, that they're inviting us into the worlds of these people by having them argue and bicker and to talk back to each other. And that man that she's with looks like a an adult child. You know what I mean? Like he has he's like he looks like yeah. the grown up but not grown up version of the kid from a Christmas story. They felt like like uh, if I could compare it to something uh, that isn't done a lot in horror, uh, at least not to my recollection. It, it's almost like the you know the the hot girl and the friend zoned guy friend. You know what I mean? Like there's no yeah. there's no there's no semblance of a relationship, but it's clear that they're familiar with each other. <laughs> it's like there's there is a disconnect. And it's clear here that from the, the that that there is a one sided. Uh, thing going on here and you know what I, I i i brought this movie here you know i've been i've had this movie on my list on my list for for mm -hmm. things to cover since pretty much the beginning of the show uh but i have a major complaint right now is it do you not feel like it was backwards to start this movie we open up with them in this in well you know once once we get to them uh they're in this well, after together. we see leatherface make his leatherface right. originally yeah. they were also going to show him unmasked to see that he had a deformed face um and they scrapped that and then they used that for the remake which honestly is a move that i uh i don't love and i'm pretty glad is not in this movie but that's a sidebar yeah and and you for for this one i think uh that was a great way to open it it almost reminded me of that halloween 5 opening with like the pumpkin uh it's not quite the same but I, it's a good way to set the tone for the movie um score aside uh which i know we'll get to as we talk about this movie um, but, uh, first time we get into the car with these people, right? And we're supposed to get this, the sense that like, and, and based on the story they've set up, by the way, I'm not making anything up. This is, this is spelled out by them between the dialogue. She is the one that's sort of uninterested in the relationship. And the guy is the one that's kind of desperate to keep it together. Uh, upset that things are kind of not, but the road trip be. was her idea, right? Road trip. Not only was the road trip her idea. But he is the one uninterested with his headphones on, on the drive there. I think this movie wants to think that it has a, a human element. I think because, like, let's be real, in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the great movie that it is, I mean, there's no personal drama to really in invite the audience. I mean, these are just college kids uh, on a road trip. Um, right. The thing is, it's off-putting from the start. Yep. And you feel trapped in this car with them. And if you've ever been trapped in a situation with the, an arguing couple, as I have, again, like <laughs> Leatherface can only be a relief from all of this. And, and the guy, Ryan in particular, is so off-putting that I actually thought that they were setting him up to become a villain. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't think he was going to be one of the Sawyer family members, because how would that right. make sense? But I would think almost that he would like be like he invited. would be the one to ditch her you know like you know that point where like she has to ditch him because he gets stuck i thought he would be the one to run from her and eventually get his comeuppance you know uh, which is interesting you know when that happens uh i wrote down in my notes um so this is not the coolest chick of all time <laughs> you know it's just <laughs> And she has a little bit of a growth throughout the movie, and, and the actress is slightly competent, but... Yeah, for the most part. We have good characters throughout this movie, for oh, we sure. Have fantastic, we is, have some fantastic characters. We actually do. We have, like, amongst this franchise, we have so, some of the best. I would agree. Which is weird for a movie that starts out so unassuming. Yeah. Uh, but can I talk about a scene that I, li I liked back then and I like now? Would love to hear it. That... <laughs> that mass grave excavation it's almost yeah. like where did this come from like this is so eerie and it yeah and watching those guys in their hazmat suits it almost felt like we took a detour to the blob remake it, it felt a little more like x files to me i don't know if yeah. it was just like the lower kind of lower budget of the movie um i don't know if that was what it was but uh such a cool scene to throw in there um and it it sets 
I like it because what it does is if, if the movie is going to exist in a world where you could reasonably watch it without seeing the first film, right? Like, it, it, I believe it tried to do that. And I don't know if they did it consciously, but with the opening crawl that they had and everything, like, you could reasonably watch this without seeing the first one. Um, it right. sets up a true... It, it gives you a visual of the true, uh, like, presence of scale. danger that these people are yeah. in and the scale of, of, of how dangerous these people are. Um and uh, it really, it, it feels like it's almost out of a different movie if you didn't have the rest of this movie to go, you know? Now, if I were that if I were that couple, though, I would see that and just do a big old U-turn and, <laughs> and drive right back to California. Yeah, that belong. seems like a red flag, uh, honestly. Um, I mean, going through Texas itself is probably a red flag. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm joking. I, Texas people. I'm somebody kidding. who did a road trip through texas obviously i'm i'm from texas i'm from houston which is east texas but uh on my move from california uh me and my wife did a road trip and we drove through all of texas to get to houston so from from west to east and i saw some things <laughs> i saw some things on that trip luckily though uh after this great scene it doesn't take us too long to get our next great scene in my in my opinion uh, because eventually they, they show up to a service station, uh, mm -hmm. and we get to meet two of, of my, two of honestly, my favorite characters in the franchise, uh, Tex Sawyer portrayed by Viggo Mortensen and the MVP of this movie, Alfredo okay. Sawyer. <laughs> so I, I, so I wrote down in my notes, right? Ken Foree is the MVP of this movie and we'll get to Ken Foree. Yeah. But then a few scenes later, I scratched that out and said Alfredo. Tom Everett. MVP yeah. Tom Everett as Alfredo Sawyer is the fucking MVP of this movie. The guy carries the load. And, and don't get me wrong. I think Viggo Mortensen's performance in this is actually like really good. I think Matthew McConaughey, when you watch him in Next Generation, you know, you can kind of in some scenes, you can kind of see how this guy could be big. But like, you know, a lot of it is like, oh, this guy has the look of a movie star, right? Like Viggo Mortensen, when you watch him in this movie, like he he's got a lot of subtleties to his character that really help kind of show who this guy is. I, I really liked his performance. Yeah, too. I think I think all of the villains' uh, performances, I think all the actors uh, bring that kind uh, th those those great touches to their characters. And I think uh, I'm not sure how great these villains are on paper, but there's something about the actors that bring them to life, and especially watching their chemistry together. And you know I'm what? I want to include Jennifer Banco in that. Yeah, the, returning to the show, Jennifer Banco, who was in uh, The New Blood when we covered that movie. She plays the younger version of our uh, of our main <laughs> psychokinetic character. Um, uh, in this one, she plays the little girl. I don't believe she even has a name. I think she's just called the little girl. Um, I was even surprised by her. Like She she didn't do a whole lot after this. Um, and she's not acting now, to my knowledge. Although Viggo Mortensen, he's such a striking looking man. I mean, he's yeah. not pretty boy handsome in the way that McConaughey is, right? He's not going to yeah. be starring in, you know. It's like an unconventional handsome, handsome you know, like like a, like a Benedict Cumberbatch or something, you know? <laughs> like, something like, like that. Yeah, women find a way to, uh, to to like these strange looking guys when they have this this sort of quality about them. And he, he's got it. And I feel like he has it in this movie. There's, you know, like even this first kind of scene where we meet him, he's just, he's, he's trying to get them to give him a ride back home. Um, and, you know, basically... Uh, baby firefly his way into their car and uh he, he doesn't get the opportunity to but like his disappointment and like the way that he he comes across as a good as a good guy like you know you kind of get this sense of like mystery about him but he does a good job now, there's a version there's a version of this movie where he he could have been a good guy he could have been uh yep. he could have been uh the hero of the movie and that would have worked just as well because he plays both of those sides Equally, yeah. equally well. I'm glad they went the route they did because it's a real treat to see him uh, play such a disturbing character. But you know, he really raises the bar of this movie. Um, and yeah. if for nothing else, you know, we can all be thankful that this helped give him a stepping stone, how, however big, however small. Right. Um, or at least wasn't a roadblock. Fix. Yeah. At least it wasn't a roadblock for him. At um, least he didn't uh, sue the makers of the film <laughs> to stop him from re-releasing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, even if he did, we would still have the performance of Tom Everett as Alfredo Sawyer. Clean that trap, Alfred. Oh, you motherfucker. Don't 
don't tell me what I should do. Uh, who we both at this point have acknowledged as the MVP of this movie. Immediately He's the Captain shining. Spaulding of this movie. Oh my god, immediately shining in this. I, 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 his character makes me upset alone that we didn't get a sequel where he somehow survives. Because let me tell you, the moment you see this guy to the, to the last moment you see him is, is a treat. It's a delight. Everything he says is great. Uh, even just the, the small thing, you know, I'm going to service you real good, man. Don't you worry about it. He's got this way of talking that's so good. Uh, as the movie goes on, it gets even better. Um, there's a, a really funny scene where Ken Fury, uh confronts him in the forest, and I, I absolutely that's my favorite scene in the entire movie. I call that um, scene Clash of the Titans because dude, it's he's got so the two good. MVPs going head to head. Oh my god, it's so good. Let's uh, let's get into Leatherface himself, the titular character. Finally, the titular character. I honestly yeah. don't know how popular of a character Leatherface was at this time. Like, I don't even know how many people knew the name Leatherface. I, yeah, I'm guessing it's, it's hard it to around. contextualize back then. I think, I, I, from what I remember, the second movie was was fairly successful on like home video release. Uh, when it came, so out. I think like, it was a modest success overall. I mean, it def it didn't light the world on fire, and I, I, I think there's a reason why they went this soft reboot direction and and not uh, not try to make a direct sequel to that movie. Yeah, but. You know, Leatherface, you know, he starred in two movies um, compared to Freddy, Jason, Michael. Uh, you know, they were making movies like year after year and they were like really pro proving themselves as movie stars. How, where does Re Leatherface actually rank in your favorite villains, like your favorite slasher villains, movie villains? Where Where is he up there for you? Um, you know, movie villains, I mean, there's so many different types of movies. I usually don't try to loop to, to group. I, I try to do movie villains by genre. Um, I would say it's in the same place that the franchise is for me tied for third. Um, I like Jason Voorhees a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but I like Leatherface just as much. Honestly, uh, I, I like I, what I like about both those characters is that there's similarities between them, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, they're just sort of these yeah, deformed especially... freaks. <laughs> Especially when you look at that uh, second um, Friday the 13th, I've always said that I feel like they were actually trying to emulate Leatherface more than than Michael Myers. I think they took elements from from both, which is what I th that's why I think I like Jason is because he's, he's he's kind of both of them. You know, he's kind of uh, a bit of Michael Myers, a bit of Leatherface and a bit of his own thing. And um, I, I, I think I like Leatherface so much because he's a versatile character. Uh, you can set up his lore to really be anything and it kind of works, you know, whether you want to make him just your sort of generic, um, you know, run of the mill slasher like they did in the newest remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre or the newest reboot rather, uh, or the Netflix version. I, I would argue they did that in the remake. I, I think people would in be way. irritated at hearing me say that. Um, it wasn't uh, as egregious as I'm making it sound. They just, I, I, they stripped him of a lot of his eccentricities as far as what they, distinguishes him from his fellow slasher yeah. icons they wanted to go away from so toby hooper has has gone on record to say that that the first film and the second film were very much like uh there was a lot of dark humor in them and and part of that is leatherface's eccentricities i think i i you know him screaming and yelling and you know putting on lipstick and all that stuff like and i think with the remake what they wanted to just be straight laced and like we are making this guy into a scary thing i i don't think that although they still scary they still incorporate some they do some oh, sense for sure. of humor it's respectful, I, mean, that's, I believe i believe yeah, it's, it's respectful. respectful they strike a good balance i like this leatherface which is important because leatherface is uh he's actually my third too i think if the sequels had been able to sustain what made him so damn effective in that original movie he'd he probably he'd probably be higher but i feel like they only really nailed the character once and we've seen these very interesting variations on him ever since obviously like in the second movie you have a really uh goofy <laughs> yeah. um almost uh, like silly. a uh, yeah almost like a comic relief version like he's not full like he's still got scary things about him like but I mean, he's but, still threatening i mean yeah. he's he, he's more dangerous in that movie than in the first one. Oh yeah for sure but i to me it's like that's like the patrick star version of leatherface you know he <laughs> I never thought of it that way. That's really good. I mean, he he even like ha he he develops a little crush, like a little schoolboy crush 
on our uh on on the final girl and which by the way she's in this uh she's got an uncredited cameo in this movie the only um, bit of connective tissue between the third and the second now caroline yeah. williams says in her her head she's still playing stretch they don't credit her that way right um, and and this is actually she's returning to the show too uh she was in uh, our patreon episode on leprechaun 3 uh so two returning uh <laughs> two returning actors of course to this she's show. in um she's in both of our favorite horror movies of all yeah. time uh Rob Zombie's Halloween too. Thank you for being the one to bring it up this time, um, so that I don't. Are you scared? Uh, Are you yeah, scared a little that bit. this game played out? Are a little you, bit. Because uh, I was, I was a little guess worried. what? I... It's the fifteenth anniversary, so we are not. Yes. We are not dropping that ball now. No, yeah, maybe no, maybe sir. we'll see a little bit more about uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween two this year. Who knows? Maybe maybe, maybe the time is coming. Maybe. But uh, uh, I, I so. Um, Leatherface in this movie, I want to I want to say something about him um, that I think is really cool. I like that. Okay, so I don't like that we don't get as much of him as I think I would like us to have. People have called this that he's the titular character right now, and and people have called this the blandest Leatherface. I don't agree with that. Um, what I what I do think is though, I, I I'm really surprised more people don't talk about the fact that I really think they capitalize on this guy when they do show him. I mean. We still have some of the eccentricities about him, right? And, and I want to talk about that in a second because we get a really cool and fun scene, like a break from our, our madness, if you will, uh, at some point in this movie that I think is really cool. Um, but first of all, the look. I mean, Greg Nicotero was, I believe, the lead effects on yeah. this movie, designed uh, and helped put together this Leatherface. Uh, honestly, and I know this is controversial, this is actually my favorite design for Leatherface, aside from there. the remake. Um, the remake Ooh, is. Oh, I really I know, don't like the remake look. I know that that's a hot take. Uh, see, the remake. Here's the thing about the remake. It's the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie I had the pleasure of seeing. So that's my sort of definitive look for him. And when I see an older version of him, I have an appreciation for it. And obviously, you know that would turn into the the evolved look of him over time. Um, I know people have complaints that it looks a little too like rubbery, uh, and not uh, looks too face rubbery. Enough. He looks <laughs> like the Joker to me. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about it works. Uh, I, I don't know. If, I don't know what it is. Uh, but this movie has has that same quality for me. It's, it's something about that look just works for me. Um, I like that they they sort of '90s him up, but not as bad as like Halloween did. I think they did a better job than Halloween did. Um, Do you, you like know, his mullet? Yeah, it works. I, I gotta it's say, it kind of works. I, I feel like it works. Uh, the only time I feel like it doesn't work is the end of the movie, um, where he gets, uh, where his hair gets all wet, um, because you the 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 mask is just subtle enough in that dark light. Which, by the way, this movie is very dark. <laughs> it's and when they go outside, you can't see anything. Uh, they spend a lot points. of time outside. Um, and uh, so at the end of the movie, you know, I don't want to get into it too much, but you know, Leatherface gets drenched in in water and is in this lake or pond. Um, and I, I like couldn't tell it was him at first. I was like, who's this lady all of a sudden? The first time I watched this, by the way, I was like, who's this lady coming out of the water? I was like, oh, that's Leatherface. Okay. Yeah, I see it now that they zoomed in, but in the dark, um, I couldn't tell who it was. Um, I want to ask you, though, where does this rank amongst your uh, Leatherface looks? The look is up there. I And um, of the Leatherfaces that uh, I'm going to call the, the Jason Leatherfaces, like, the ones that are trying to serve that purpose of being the big bad because yeah uh in those first two movies uh, Le leatherface plays a pretty different role so of that strain of leatherface is is probably my favorite and i think after that i i i like his look in the beginning something that i really like about this character and i think this movie lives up to that is that leatherface is a character where it's always it every movie Leatherface always feels like a performance, like yeah, like not just a stunt man being being generically directed to be you know threatening Absolutely. or menacing. Like there's always like an actor giving this character an interpretation, and I don't even like all the performances of this character, but that's always a quality I really appreciated about him. Obviously, this actor um, whose name escapes me, you know, he again he's. He understands the assignment. He's going to be a more intimidating, a more threatening Leatherface. But uh, I still see some of that child, like man-child sensibility about him. Uh, I like how curious he is with technology and just oh, kind of like playing with his victims. Um, he is uh, a loving father to his little <laughs> girl. 
Now, the thing that I don't like about this movie is Leatherface is that they turn him into a rapist. I don't know why that bothers me as much as it does, given uh, who Leatherface is based on. Ed Gein, it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise. I just don't like the fact that in the 90s, they were making all of their slasher villains a bunch of sex pests between him and Michael Myers. I will say this. This is the... Uh, this is by far the less egregious version of that for me because it seems not out of the question. You know, we sort of, it's sort of hinted towards that in the second movie uh, that he's, uh, he's got this side to him. That's uh, less about killing. He's more of a, more, more about loving, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, and, and in this one, uh, they, they do it subtly enough to where there's nothing outright disturbing. You know, there's nothing like, they don't show you anything. Uh, it's it's an illusion, right? Uh, they they talk about him knowing what to do with the ladies' privates, um, which, by the way, that hook hand character. I can't think of the the, the um, name of that character at the moment, but uh, I, I think he's I think he's a, another cool character that they introduce in this. He, he doesn't have as much to do as as Tex and as uh, Alfredo. I'd say it's arguably the honestly, and this is this is gonna be controversial. And, but that's what we're here to do, right? Um, this is my favorite Sawyer family overall. I think it's the best overall. Because, you know, I think the, the father is very good in the first two, along with, uh, you know, I, I like Leatherface. The first movie, I don't really take to any of them as much as a lot of people do. It's really just Leatherface and, uh, and, and we don't you know, spend a lot of time with them. <laughs> no. Right? We, uh, I think it's the second movie that, that decided we're right. going to make the family dynamic kind of a, a staple of these movies, which is something yeah. that they unfortunately have abandoned ever since uh, the beginning. All of these uh, Texas Chainsaw entries have really abandoned the family dynamic. You know, Texas Chainsaw oh. 3D, Leatherface, the prequel. Um, his co- they, they, the cousins team up in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D. So I, or Texas Chainsaw 3D. So I don't want to hear that, okay? Uh you know, do your thing cuz. Um but no, you're 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 right. I mean like sort of the Leatherface, you know, Leatherface by itself, not the part 3 that we're talking about now. Leatherface from what 2016, 2015 somewhere in that range. Something like that. Um that movie sort of has this family dynamic that they put through, but it's not strong because of the prequel nature and it doesn't shine because they're not there's nothing particularly interesting about any of them. Part two is my second favorite, I would say, because I really love, I mean, who doesn't love Chop Top? Um, even the, they let Grandpa shine in the second one, which I think is so funny. Uh, that's, it, it's almost, um, you know, like Dan Aykroyd in, uh, in uh, nothing, nothing But Trouble, trouble. levels. Um, really fun. Um, but this is, this is my second favorite because I think overall, or this is my, this is my absolute favorite because I think overall each of the characters are strong enough on their own that when they come together, it, it just creates something really cool and, and believably evil, uh, almost to the point where it's like mundane for them. They're not like, they're not in your face evil. They're not like overly taunting. They're, they do their taunting and you know, once, you know, she's all tied up, but like, it's, it's a different way, you know, like when he's nailing her, mm. her hands in and Viggo Mortensen is doing that. And then he goes, so how do you like Texas? You know, it's like, this is strange. He's not doing it over the top. He, it's almost like he's trying to make conversation for real. You know, it's, it's taunting in a way, but I don't know, man, this, it's, it, it balances out well for me. It does. Uh, and again, gives like a great context for Leatherface. Like I absolutely he has a very clear relationship with all of those yep. family members, especially hook hand guy who I guess Leatherface is the reason he has a hook hand because he, yeah. he his, <laughs> which is so cool the that moment. they put that in there, right? Like I love that world building of this family, you know that, and then he gets him the new saw, uh, and then he's sort of the tech guy, right? So Although, he builds him this what the speaking spell. <laughs> let me explain to the makers of this movie how you're supposed to do it, okay? In this movie, you show the guy with the hook hand, and then you make a whole prequel explaining how <laughs> he got the hook hand. And that's the whole point of the movie. You introduce characters, but they don't matter. They're they're they cannon fodder. The only thing we need to see is the hook. This hand. movie burned through at least three prequels worth of material. <laughs> Literally oh burned. God. You know. Oh man. Burned off its hand. Um, yeah. Instead of yeah. shooting yourself in the foot, they burned off their hand. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, but uh, no, I mean, like, I, I want to ask you, is there a character that you think uh, is sort of weaker in this movie than, than like, is there, I guess the family well, dynamic, where does this rank for you uh, as far as, like, the family goes? Oh, and, and the where family, do you think the characters yeah. get weak? Well, I mean, the, the characters get weak with our main characters, which is quite unfortunate. Kind of. Our two, our, our couple, we'll say that, our couple. Because couple. I don't think Ken Free suffers from anything, honestly. Ken Free suffers from not being in this movie enough. Uh, that I can agree with, but he shines when he's there. So it's not like, you know, like with the, with the actress, I'd say she's a pretty good, normal person character. And she's okay as a victim, like, you know, like when she's captured, but she's not good at being crazy. <laughs> that is what I would say holds her back. The guy is a man child. That's what holds him back. Ken Free doesn't really have anything that, that holds him back besides the oh. fact that he's not in it enough. He shines in every scene he's in. He's a lousy shot. He also runs a little funny. Did you notice that at the end of the movie? <laughs> Where he, he jumps bit. from the explosion. Uh, he's very, uh, not, not he quite Steven Seagal funny. levels. Yeah, jumps funny too. Not quite as bad as Steven Seagal, but uh, you know, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not far down that list either. But, it, I mean, it's a shame to say that the main characters hold i mean they hold the, they hold back the first half cuz that's that that was my problem when i first saw this movie i think i really checked out after the first half and uh, a lot of the the really gnarly stuff we get in the second half kind of just washed over me this time though after they get to the Sawyer house there's some stuff i enjoyed the the i actually really liked leatherface's first appearance not not the opening prologue but when he's uh, stalking them and you just hear the squeak of his oh yeah leg brace. Really, really good cool. stuff. Really, really cool. But then when they get to the house after that, I, I kind of loved this movie. Like if it had been that for a whole movie, or at least if they if they could have like, um, I don't know, just figured out a way to really take what they captured there, make it feature length, this would really be an elevated sequel for me. Maybe not one that could match the original because it doesn't have that raw quality. I mean, this is yeah, this is New Line Cinemas trying to make um, another franchise, and that that's pretty obvious. But it would have, it could have started that franchise. I think people in 1990 probably had the same reaction that I did at first. Like I, like, just this this really seriously waning interest by by minute ten. I'll say this, it's it's very understandable to to check out when watching the first part of this movie. Uh, I, I definitely uh, understand how somebody could do that. I want to ask you, and obviously this is an extreme hypothetical, but like uh, a movie like House of a Thousand Corpses is an example of a movie that kind of grips you from minute one, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it has something that occurs, but it doesn't ruin anything later in the movie. Um, do you think this movie could have benefited from something like that? Or maybe we don't meet every member of the Sawyer family right away, but maybe we open up with, you know, some lady in the woods, right? And uh, she, it's dark and she's running around. Maybe the lady Which is interesting because in they even set that up because right. we have this, um, we have Leatherface making his Leatherface. Yes. Then we have one of his victims escaping and fleeing. Uh, and we cut from that to these, you know, th this, this couple, um, on their road trip and there's like a mid big disconnect for me i mean i know it's going to oh, come yeah. back later but it comes back too late uh, it, i actually forgot about that girl yeah. yeah it feels out of place if we would have opened up like let's say you know she escapes and then we get into the movie and she's running through the woods and then maybe you know false jump scare she runs into somebody that she that's also in the house uh, and they escaped and then leatherface just cuts that person's head off right she still lives you still get her later in the movie like you've already written into the script but it gives us something it gives us a preview of Leatherface. You don't even have to show them all. You can do it from, you know, leg down, right? So you see the brace that they then, you know, show later in the movie as our as our preview to him. Um, you know, something to get us hooked into the movie, because if you immediately go into unlikable characters being unlikable, it's, it's one of the issues I kind of have with the Friday the 13th remake, right? Where, like, we mm -hmm. just... I like that breakup where we get to see what Jason's capable of and everything, but we spend too long in my mind with these unlikable people uh, to set up the rest of the movie. And so, you know, it's not a disconnect like this one is. Uh, this one is a little bit more egregious, but Ken Free, we sort of meet him uh, just post accident. Uh, he's got a bloodied head. 
um, and he's uh, you know he's he's trying to help our main characters out. Um, he comes into the movie too late. I yeah, I stand by that. I, I, I know that it would have been hard to introduce him earlier because you have a couple of characters to introduce, right? But just I mean, just from a basic screenwriting one hundred and one, you know, this happens well after the first act, and yeah. he becomes um, almost a protagonist. I mean, you know, our our final so. girl is tied up and immobile for a while, and it's up to Ken. Uh, we follow Ken uh, trying to save the day. So he's the co-protagonist. You know, he's he's uh, he's the co-survivor. You know, um, I think he's, he's the one uh, who survives multiple on-screen deaths. And he's certainly the hero that, in my mind, carries the movie. And I don't mean to insult the actress in that way. I just, I don't think she was given a whole lot to work with. I don't think they played to her strengths as an actress. Because she's got some strong moments in this movie, man. But, like, then they make her go crazy. And uh, and we'll get there. Um, but uh, with Ken Faree, um now at this point in time in his career, uh, you know, he, had of, of course, was known for Dawn of the Dead. Uh, that's, you know, the thing that I think everybody kind of knows him for who's not a, a, a Rob Zombie fan. Um, but, uh, he's coming off, <laughs> he's coming off of Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Uh, which, which he has a, not, a it's a terribly small part in. No, it has a higher really? rating than this movie, yep. Well, I do like that movie, but that's a little bit of a crime. And <laughs> speaking of crime, he is criminally underused in that movie. It's actually... Yeah, I, I had to pause the movie and really look at him. Like, did they cast Ken Faria as a nameless security guard? Like, I know his star um, wasn't where it was now. I mean, now he's a pretty big damn name, especially to people like us. But in the horror uh, community, for sure. Uh, yeah, but he was also he had a great part in um, From Beyond. Have you seen that? Yeah, I have. I, I would now, agree. We do see his bulge a lot in that. And I'm wondering if maybe people didn't want uh, to see Ken for a while after that. So yeah, I don't know. And like when Rob started putting him in his movies, like you know he's in the first Rob Zombie's Halloween, um, and he's in Lords of Salem. And I would argue Lords of Salem is one of his strongest performances uh, in a movie. Um, it, they gave him a chance. One of the to best movies. Be dude. It's one of the best movies ever made. So that's not surprising. Uh, Ken Faree, I think, uh, you know, just as he shines through in Lords of Salem, I do believe he shines through at moments in this. S sort of similar to the actress, I don't think they gave him material that quite plays to his strengths as much as... as oh, you don't think so? I, I, don't know. I think I think he rocks in this movie. The I, I think he rocks as well. The, the complaints that I have are moments where I, I, he didn't i don't feel like he interacted enough as the action hero type because that's what he's set up to be in this right he's kind of set up to be like the action hero the one-liner guy um he's got some good ones i think uh but he's got some weak ones too like um i think his weakest moment in the movie for me uh and i don't think it's a weakness for him i think it adds a lot of charm to the movie um but uh, it did, certainly didn't play to his strengths is is when he sort of sees that Leatherface is about to carve up you know, our, our, our main, our leading, leading lady. Uh, and he's like, what does he say? He's like, you motherfuckers. And then shoots he, through he, I think the he window. just says motherfuck. That, that motherfuck, that could be it. Um, but, uh, I, like, he's got some great one-liners, man. Like, there's that, there's that part where he's, he's talking to Viggo Mortensen. He's like, it's the like, fuck is wrong this? with you people? Why don't you leave us alone? And he's like, we got hungry. Haven't you ever heard of pizza? Like, dude, that's, that's great. Like, it does, it adds such a charm to this movie and it's all, from the hero I, side, I really, he carries I really the entire have, thing. I don't really have any complaints about Ken Forey as far Very as fair. what he does on screen. Um, I've never had any complaints about Ken Forey. I think, uh, I think the dude's bitching. Okay. Oh, he's awesome. From from this to Joe Grizzly, just love seeing him around. Um, <laughs> although Joe Grizzly, bitch. He has a tendency to be underused. Hundred percent. Uh, which in this case is something they thankfully corrected because famously he he died in the original cut of this movie. <laughs> Obviously, he gets a chainsaw yeah. through the skull. There's uh, also an alternate just, ending for this movie for those who uh, I've not see seen it. that. Uh, does that come with the Blu-ray? It does. Yes, it's uh, on the Blu-ray as well as the unrated version is on the Blu-ray. Um, the which unrated is, version. That is yeah, like, the unrated version is still carved to shit. So uh, just to let everybody know, don't go into it thinking you're getting anything that different. Uh, you, you get a little less of a cutaway for ha like, what is it? Like half a second difference in that, uh, the scene where they drop the, the see, hammer on the guy? Um, maybe, but the big thing is you see some fingers get blown off. Yeah, it's it's not huge. It's not a big difference. I would be morbidly curious to check out that 
uh, original cut, the pre MPAA butchering yeah. cut. But Ken Furry, what I do like, um, I know, I know you said something about how you know, he doesn't interact with the family as much as like maybe an action hero should. But I like that he doesn't just come in and. Oh, I, I do up. like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish, I wish his, 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 I think. Well, first of all, let's talk about this movie's fairly short. I, it's like what an hour and twenty minutes. This movie really barely registered with me when I first yeah. watched it. The way it, fl it flew by, and I think that's a structural problem. I think it's just backloaded. Uh, if you had kind of broken, because I think the stuff that goes on in the house is is gold. Like this time, yeah. I really pretty much loved all of, all of the details they threw in, all the lines, all the macabre, warped shit. I mean, th this movie actually genuinely upset me with some of the images it showed me um dude and, and and like it makes you appreciate some of it too like it, it can go for and, and it doesn't feel like it's like tonally all over the place but it can make you go from like chuckling like you know when he gives him the saw and it says the saw's family and it's like this cool looking like thing and he's like and he's like posing with it and it's like kind of funny but then like in the background there's this little girl with like a doll with a skull head and she's calling Sally. It's a, like a dead infant. It's the yeah. It's like supposed to be a dead infant. I think that's so. Skin and, is and rotting away. Her room is full of human bones that one of which she uses to stab our protagonist. <laughs> um, dude, like there's some upsetting shit. But it, like, would you agree that this movie kind of strikes enough of a balance where it doesn't feel all over the place? You know, like it I, it it feels well, it's not, like it fits. It's not all over the place, and and that it's like. Di you know disjointed you know like yeah. uh, i feel like i'm in a different movie now what i will say is it's uneven you know again there are uneven parts uh it's just totally backloaded for me i yeah. mean if you could take that stuff in that house and find a way to kind of sprinkle that throughout the movie you'd have a really meaty movie um and it's a movie that has the opposite problem that most movies like this have where a lot of movies run out of gas right yeah I've, I've seen a lot of movies with great openings uh, that just, I, yeah, the Friday the 13th, I think it's a pretty good example. The remake. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that, their prologue, it, it peaks with the prologue um, and then kind of steadily loses gas. And by the end of the movie, I, you know, I'm, I'm like ready for it to be end, for it to end. Uh, oh. Not so with this movie. Yeah. I like when it ends, I'm like, you, but we just got to the good part. <laughs> It, this movie definitely so first of all it's it's an easy watch like it's not one that you're going to sit down and uh you know i again i love godzilla 98 but that movie is the, arguably the longest movie ever made if you watch it um casablanca is right up there for me too you just sit down and watch it you're there forever this is not one of those movies um, i've never heard someone compare godzilla 98 to casablanca especially unfavorably so I, I can't just let that slide. What do you mean Casablanca is the longest movie ever made? What do you oh, it's mean so by long. that? Oh, it's so long. It's, oh my God, it's so long. Uh, it, it's the perfect movie. It's a perfect movie. Oh, congratulations for thinking that way. I think it's long as hell. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but anyways, um, you know, I don't, I don't like the finer things in life. I like to drink fucking whatever this movie is. Um, you know, like, it, I, I will say, I will agree with that 100%. I, I think this movie, it's over before you know it in, in a sense. But where it drags is the is the part that you kind of don't want it to drag. You know, a lot of people say, like, if you're going to let a movie drag, let it drag in the middle. You don't want it to drag in the beginning, and you don't want it to drag at the end. And they didn't have a problem with it dragging in the middle or the end, but the middle and the end are, they almost feel rushed through. Like, you're done with the movie before you realize you're done. Uh, and the, the back half that is there is so good that you just want it to keep going. But they don't, it's like they don't have enough of it. Uh, and that's also my complaint. Let's look at it from the perspective of this, because this movie feels like a pilot, which is what it is. It's a pilot for the yeah, that's fair. Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. This is a new line, <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. But is it a good one? Because uh, a number of my favorite characters die, but not enough characters die. That little girl didn't die. She, she didn't get her fucking head shot off or something which is the only that's the only time i've i've wanted uh to see a little girl perish in a movie yeah here's here's what i honestly think so i i do think the ending of the movie is and and there are a couple of parts that i want to go back to before we we end our discussion but i think the end of the movie for me i i actually enjoyed what they did there sort of alluding back to the first movie with leatherface kind of showing up at the end and 
you know, walking up to, you know, <laughs> rev his chainsaw once again before we go to the credits. Um, but I almost would have wanted almost like a family portrait kind of ending, you know, uh, where we sort of see the aftermath of all these characters surviving. I don't think Alfredo should have been shot. I don't think he should have showed up again at the end unless they were going to show that he survived his encounter with Ken Fury. Um, I, I think Alfredo should have lived. I think Tex should have lived. I mean, I think they should have done something with Tex. Tex seems like the, now. yeah. I mean, Tex seems like the star. Other than Leatherface, who you know, Leatherface is always going to be around. You can't kill Leatherface. But if you if you can find somebody to be the face of it, an actor to be the face of it, that's what right. you want. Um, you know, that that's like a really um, that's a quality that a lot of these franchises don't appreciate. Like, yes, we do like the. Um, the master villains we all we all like yeah, right yeah yeah but that's gonna sell the merch <laughs> you need someone to counterbalance that so halloween yeah. has donald pleasance and i would argue he is just as he's more responsible for the sustainability of that franchise the thing is that robert england as freddy krueger you know he's not a mass killer he's disfigured but you know his face is on all the posters we love freddy we can't imagine anyone else playing freddy uh, and that's something uh, that the Friday franchise, Friday the 13th, didn't really have a handle on. Uh, that's something that I think it could have really benefited from, even though I love those movies. Um, you you do miss that that continuity of a, of a familiar face. You know, I wish there was like a Laurie Strode or a Donald Pleasance or uh, a Nancy or something like that. Or a Sidney Prescott, best example. That's why... The Scream films um, are always, they're so, um, I don't know, it's like a more like a season of television. Like that's how much continuity there there feels to be. And like Friday the 13th is like an anthology series starring Jason almost. What I think I appreciate about this movie is that they don't necessarily try to be that over the top and do that much like the, the humor that they use in this is very different i think than the one that they did earlier in the franchise maybe a little closer to the original film than the second one um but i don't feel like they try to go that much over the top and i think the funny moments are much more subdued one of which is my second favorite scene in this movie and i want to get your opinion on it uh ken Fury is sort of making his way through the the forest and the trees trying to figure out where to go and how to find our hero um and he comes across and we get to see leatherface a little bit before this but he comes across leatherface in this like i guess shed or something uh playing <laughs> with a speaking spell um and he's you know like a clown Don't comes up on the screen. Again. yeah the, the clown comes up on the screen and he's typing food and and he's like getting angry at it i thought that scene was so awesome and it just it's like it doesn't discredit the character right it doesn't make him too goofy it makes it it plays it on that childish nature of him it, it doesn't make something. him not scary though i would appreciate that scene more in like the second one or, or something that really embraces so. the 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 dark comedy of the character more let me ask you this connor as as a fan i, I consider myself a fan of this film now but i know you, you really championed this movie what do you think they could have done to really continue this as a franchise from this point like, let's say this did gangbusters at the box office uh would you have liked to see them continue with this family and this version of leatherface like make direct sequels Absolutely. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen, I, I could see them evolving Leatherface's look over time. Obviously, he gets new victims, get, makes new masks and all that stuff. So I could see the look, you know, changing up slightly over time. I think the Leatherface actor is really good. Um, I cannot mm -hmm. pronounce his name, but it's like R.A. Mihaloff or something. Um, That's, you want the guy playing Leatherface to have a real, you know down southern name like ra yeah yeah i i mean i i thought he did a good job i've heard uh unfortunate things about people meeting him in person but um mm -hmm. you know uh I, I think is a i i might be mixing him up with uh i i know for a fact that people have said that about the remake leatherface uh who's also in one of my favorite movies of all time batman returns um but yes. uh chip yeah uh but uh honestly yeah i would have liked to have seen even with how the movie was right like it, it, this was what the movie was um i would have liked to have seen 
this cast come back. Uh, I would like to see the mother return. I'd like to see the, the little girl return, Jennifer Banks. She was shot in the head, so that might be... Difficult. Yeah, but, you know, there people have come back from worse. Uh, Alfredo certainly could have survived a shotgun blast direct to the chest, 100%. It's horror, and you can do anything. Um, no, I'm, I'm honestly upset that they killed off who they did. Um, a text, I think, reasonably could have survived <laughs> if you really needed to force it. He could have come back as like a disfigured killer. Yeah, like a you know burned up and all of that stuff. Honestly, um, you know, I say this in a lot of these, uh, not because I'm I'm desperate to uh, to you know get hired to do a movie, but uh, because I I really do I think it would be cool. You know, I I think that uh, you know there there are things that I would like to see. Honestly, if if I'm if I'm in charge of remaking Friday the Thirteenth, there is a or Friday the Thirteenth. I'm sorry, Texas Chainsaw Massacre um we've covered a lot of horror in this episode folks um (laughs) i would take a lot from this movie uh i think there's a lot of the best of this franchise that's here i would have liked to have seen that continue in a sequel i think they made some mistakes in killing off who they did in the way that they did so uh because of how definitive it was but i do see a universe where a sequel could have worked you know maybe uh tex you know calls in some cousins or something (laughs) and uh they you know, they, they get a whole new clan together to, uh, to to commit some more atrocities. I don't know. I also think the problem with this movie was timing. I think I think by For 1990, sure. you know, you, you had A Nightmare on Elm Street 5. You had yeah. Friday the 13th Part 8. You had Halloween 5. Uh, regardless of how you feel about those movies, uh, their failures were indications that the, the slasher genre was just slowing down, that people were losing yep. interest. Yeah, I think this is like, what's funny is this feels like what uh, a direct sequel would have felt like to the original. Uh, Excluding some some things. I mean, if they decided, okay, we want a direct sequel to this, you know, make it a few years after the original, let's bring in, uh, let's give it a real budget. um, Let's bring in some more family members, make it bigger and badder, which is what you would normally do for a sequel. This is what that kind of would feel like uh, in a lot of ways. And if this movie had come out in like, say, 1980, yeah, this could have led to a a franchise. We could have had uh, a million of these movies. We could have had one every year, but uh, people in 1990 were kind of over uh, slasher movies. And I don't know, uh, that wouldn't come back until after screen, so they say. It's crazy how those things work. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. I, I understand that it has to happen. You know, you have to sort of let that pendulum swing back. Um, and during those times, maybe movies aren't as good. Maybe they're not doing as well at the box office. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, the timing of this. Um, do you know uh, what the budget of this movie was, by chance? I don't know off the top of my head. It looked looked to me like a three million dollar movie um i'd like to tell you but i can't find it anywhere so that's <laughs> oh, okay fun. yeah uh it's fun that uh you know i think that's interesting though because um i know two didn't do as well as they hoped right but you know you had like what was it the brown cover right yeah. uh which is sort of infamous at this point a lot of things working towards that second movie um I'm just sort of confused about one thing. So New Line has the rights for this, right? And and that's that's how it is. It's not long after this that Next Generation is made. And that is not a New Line movie. Oh, they sold so the rights they... after this flopped. So I find that interesting that they would sell the rights because if a movie if a, if a studio got a movie like this now and it bombed like I think we've kind of seen the template, right? Like they just they just reboot it again. <laughs> is like, that how is that how it goes I, these I days? I feel like it. I mean, like I I I can't think of a ton of examples, uh, but but one that comes off right you know right off the dome is is Leprechaun. Uh, the same studio that did the remake of that is I think the the you know the legacy sequel I think is doing I a guess, remake, uh, but it has nothing to so... do. Okay. Leprechaun origin. If you can't understand why that, no, not failed, origins, you... not origins. Leprechaun returns. Right. No, but I'm saying 
Leprechaun Origins failed, right? So they made oh, Leprechaun yes. Returns. Yeah. yeah. So it's just so obvious. Like, why did our Ireland Wendigo movie flop with Leprechaun fans? Oh, maybe we should actually make a Leprechaun movie. So, I mean, here it's kind of like, I mean, we, we, I mean, we did everything the fans could have asked for, right? It was in Texas. It had chainsaws. People were massacred. People weren't massacred on screen. So again, could be a, a problem if, if there were gore fans out there in 1990 buying tickets, they would not have been satisfied with this movie. I guess the question is like, okay, this flops, where do you go from here? Uh, you know, our, our zany, wacky, kind of spoofy approach that didn't light the world on fire. Our very serious, or at least serious enough to, to be stacked alongside, uh, you know, the slasher movies of the day, that that flopped too. So we don't know how to make a sequel to that first movie. And the time was not right yet to do a remake. It's funny, right? Because this is 1990, that remake is 2003. You know, they could have waited 10 years and made their own remake. But uh, yeah, that was not in the cards yet. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I want to ask you this, because I think this might be an interesting thing to look at. Right now, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is in a kind of an interesting place, right? Uh, relatively, it's not a super, it wasn't a super high budget um, legacy sequel that we got from Netflix, but I mean, it looked like a, looked like a movie. <laughs> looked like a go to the be released... kind of movie. Um, <laughs> it was supposed to be released to theaters. That was the yeah. intention. Um, it's the only one I don't own on physical media. I'd like to. Uh, I don't think. Is it even out on? I don't think media? it's been released in physical uh, form. Um, well, I don't it's Netflix, so. I know Prey did. They released Hulu released Prey, so hopefully one day Netflix will release. That was after month. a lot of demand. I don't know if yeah. there's that kind of demand for Texas Chainsaw Massacre being. Uh, if 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 I'm thinking the way that I normally think, like in a couple of years, Scream Factory will probably do a big release of all the movies. You know, like they did with Halloween and Friday the Thirteenth, and they'll do a big box set. Um, but that sort of leads to my question, right? Like Leatherface generally is a very marketable character. You know, you get a lot of t-shirts, you get action figures, you get all of these things with Leatherface as a character, but his movies are, at this point, like the character is far more successful than his movies are and generates much more revenue than his movies do and gets a lot more budget than his movies do and gets a lot more attention than his movies do. Um, I mean, you're seeing uh, just as recently as a couple of years ago, I mean, he was a heavily featured DLC character in in a Mortal Kombat video game. Um, and so what I'm curious about here is, is there even a demand for Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies anymore? Or do we just want to appreciate what we've already gotten from Leatherface at this point as a horror collective? I think you can make the argument that there has not been the demand for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Uh, I don't think there's really been a demand for more Leatherface films. I think the exception to that is, you know, the remake that piqued a lot of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, it was a damn fine film. Uh, it was just a good uh, slasher movie at a time when, uh, that, that subgenre could really need uh, a boost as it always seems to need. <laughs> and then I don't know what a sequel to that would have done. Again, I've always, you and I have speculated about why they never made sequels. I, I think it's because they chopped, chopped off his arm and they, I have, I, I'm so disappointed that we never got Leatherface with the fucking Ash Williams uh, chainsaw. Arm. If we're ever going to get that, that was not the movie to do it. I think it was. I think it would have worked. I think I think there was a world. No, no, no. Let me let me correct that. I think there's a world where it could work, and I think we're in that world. But I don't know if we were in say 2004, 2005 when they would have been developing a sequel. And you know, the interesting thing is like they're always talking about legacy sequels or sequels to these timelines. You know, like like oh well, they're are they making a sequel to? They, they yeah, they are making a sequel to. I know what you did last summer. Um, there, I, I heard more people ask, are they going to make a third Rob Zombie Halloween than anyone I've else really fun? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is never going to happen. No. <laughs> no. But I've never heard anyone ask, are they finally going to make a sequel to that Texas Chainsaw remake with Jessica Biel? I've never heard anyone ask that or speculate that or, or ask for it. It's kind of crazy. It's, it, it was this, it was this one punch. And I think that's, 
what people want from this franchise. I think I, I don't think they ever want Leatherface to go away completely, but I don't think they want to see him every couple of years. No, I could I this is kind of what bugs me about horror movies, especially remakes, right? And I know this could be a topic of conversation. I believe the remake is eligible for the show, and I know we could get deeper into it's this. It's actually then. at a three. It's at it's a finally 3. made it. Okay, zero. It was sitting yeah. at a two point nine for so long, so I'm glad it's at a three now. Um, but we talked about this in the Child's Play episode, I think. Uh, we've covered a couple. I think we've covered a few remakes, so I, c- I can't remember exactly where this conversation was. But there's this disappointment that I feel towards the attitude against you know remakes um where even if a remake is relatively beloved right we'll say relatively beloved because i think the texas chainsaw massacre remake is that right it's relatively beloved people do like it some people put it above for the, the movie that they're remaking it is it, it its reputation is quite pristine you know it's, they had yes. a big uphill battle and we never ever get sequels to these and it's not like and maybe it's me being naive and the, and the studios kind of know better when they see, yeah, we had a good box office for this movie, but, you know, uh, reception wasn't good, so we probably won't get a good return on, on a sequel. I understand that mindset. But nobody's got the balls to do it. Like, nobody. Not Friday the 13th. Not Nightmare on Elm Street. Halloween is really the big example I can think of that got a sequel, but it didn't go any further than that, even though they had a script and ready to shoot. Uh, yeah, they Texas were so Chainsaw close Massacre. to shooting. Yeah, that that movie was far closer to happening than people seem to realize. Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was there. <laughs> it yeah. was, it was going to happen. And and you know what? Like, and I want to say this. Like, I'm so desperate for it. And you know me. Like, I am a horror for commercial stuff, right? Like, when you take a movie, it's it's one of the things I appreciate the most about horror remakes, right? Because when you think back about the horror films of the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s a little bit, you know, until you got like to scream when you could, like, there's not a lot of examples of a huge commercial crossover with horror films. You got uh, Nightmare on Elm Street did, you know, that was like the MTV era, right? Where, you know, he's showing up on Nickelodeon to talk about you know, the movie coming out, which is insane that that happened. That, look that up, by the way. Robert England went on Nickelodeon with the Freddy Glove to talk about, I think, Nightmare 4. Nightmare 4, um, I've seen it. And those kids are not prepared to talk no. to Robert England. No. One of them asked, like, oh, do you miss playing nice guys? And Robert's yeah. like, oh, well, actually, it's funny you mention that because I'm doing a film and we're actually modeling it after the Woody Allen film Stardust. Have either of you seen that? <laughs> If these two poor kids just oh look to God. each other, they, they look more scared by that question than by the Freddy Club. It's right. Um, but but that's that's my big thing, right? Is like once we got to the 2000s, we really started to see like a takeoff in, and some people don't like this, but like the commercialization of horror movies where you'd see like, the big example I can think of starts with Texas Chainsaw um, Massacre remake in 2003, right? You see, not only do you see posters everywhere, you're seeing tie-in merchandise, you're seeing uh, you're seeing it everywhere. And then you started seeing that with the rest of them, right? Like Rob Zombie's Halloween was everywhere when it was coming out. My Bloody Valentine was everywhere when that was coming out. Nightmare, Friday the 13th. Just the thought of horror movies being taken to that level and, and not that we're at an awful point in time now, right? Like, you know, sure, like, people can argue that there's a little too much of a push for this elevated horror, right? But ultimately, like, the movies are still good. I just kind of miss the idea of, like, a commercialized horror and, and it being a franchise, you know? And maybe it doesn't have the legs for that. Maybe the, the what they're remaking I, doesn't have the legs. But I don't know. I think I... Texas Chainsaw had a good, had a good shot. The way I'll put it is I, I'm a populist. I I like my critical, I, I, I like my snobby art house stuff too. I, um, I, I have a lot of Criterion movies right next to me. Um, but I always want them to have a commercial power. And they yeah. do, it's just very different. So Long right. Legs, yeah. that's the movie that's tearing up the charts. And, you know, I mean, I've never heard people so astonished at box office numbers than what Long Legs did in its opening weekend. It's a $22 million opening weekend. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty shocked by that, to be honest with you. It is, but 
I was really, really awestruck. You know, I watched the TCM remake last night and I looked it up. Like, I mean, the movie made over a hundred million dollars at the box yeah. office. Like, yeah. I don't really, I mean, that's a brain melting figure compared to long legs. I don't know what it'll end up doing at the box office. And, and this is not talking about quality. I mean, it's not a movie that's trying <laughs> exactly. to yes. do those numbers. Not at right. all. Uh, but it, it, people are always like, horror is back. Horror is back. It's, you know, $22 million opening weekend. Um, but just where horror used to be, I, I mean, I, call me shallow. I, I want those numbers. I want us to yeah. continue doing those numbers, man. I'm like Matthew McConaughey and the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, got to get those numbers up. Uh, not, not that lo- not that a movie like Long Lakes needs to do that, but I think we no. need those tentpole franchises or tentpole characters. Yeah, uh, and it's not like you don't have them nowadays. I mean, Halloween made a good amount of money, the first one that came back, and then uh, it, yeah. I mean, it did amazing. It, it was, a, that was a big deal. That was... Isn't that the highest grossing horror movie of all time? Is it? I think it is. I guess that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be surprising. I think it is. I guess sure. it is. I guess it is. But even like, I Know What You Did Last Summer, the original, that made $110 million yeah. in 1998. Like, what the hell? Like a... I like that movie, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of a mid-tier horror movie, and yeah, had had, had some star power. But a hundred ten million dollars, really, like really, yeah. Like Chucky movies can't even get released to theaters anymore. Texas Chainsaw movies don't get released to theaters anymore. But I know what you did last summer. Um, yeah, uh, how many seven? Wait, what am I? What am I saying? Like. Nine figures. Yeah. What? Nine figures. Right? I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, I, I mean, to, to relate it back to this movie, though, like, we're sort of at a point now where it's not quite as it was in the early 90s and even into the mid-90s where, like, people are sort of starved for good horror movies and they feel really, like, the horror movies that do have big budgets feel like sellouts and the movies that have small budgets feel really cheap. And we're not there now. I, I think now overall horror, as far as quality, is at one of the best points that it's ever been at. As far as like, you have people who make movies for like thirty bucks <laughs> that yeah. are really high quality stuff. I mean, I'm sitting here with a person who made a low budget horror movie wow. that that really did a good job at at doing what it was setting out to do. And you can do that on so many levels, whether it's independent or even big budget movies. I mean, one could argue that A Quiet Place is kind of doing that now. It's not necessarily a movie that I thought or wanted to, uh, you know, get a franchise out of, but it's still making good money at the box office. People are still talking about it. Um, and People I like that prequel. That. People they did. like that prequel yeah. a lot. Um, so, I, you know, it disappoints no. me when I look back at a movie like Leatherface and, and I see it at, at a place, uh, at an unfortunate position where it kind of came out like a movie would now. It just doesn't have a lot of hype, didn't do a lot at the box office, and there are movies that get lost in the shuffle like that now. Um, but even now, I think that movie would have a better chance um, considering the Netflix movie did pretty, I mean, like as far as people watching it, like a lot of people did watch it. Um, so I don't know, man. I, I think, I think you were right when you said Texas Chainsaw Massacre needs to take a little bit of a break. I think it could have benefited from a, from a longer break back in 1990. It might be a franchise that, is like a once in a generation thing. I think some franchises are, could be. require that kind of time. I mean, that general that generational break from the original to the remake, um, they gave that movie a lot. It gave it the breathing room to find its own identity. Yeah. Uh, to put their own spins on on tropes that are very very true to that original movie. It, it's it almost finds that perfect balance tonally at least of of doing their own thing but saying truth to the original i i think substance wise that's where i i think they played it too safe but you know i, I mean with the numbers that it did i mean it's hard to argue with with that success right uh ironically i think the prequel had a lot more substance to it, it, it definitely um in terms of plot and characters and then that's a movie that i think is considered kind of just torture porn like people don't think that movie has anything going on so i don't know it, this this franchise and there's no consensus around it that's the big thing there's not even a consensus about what the best movie in this franchise is because a lot of people love that remake more than the original i i will never get there but i i acknowledge that 
we're going to see where we both land. Yeah, uh, yeah, we will. So stay tuned. But yeah. uh, I know we've we've talked a lot about things that are not exactly this movie. We've had a wide ranging topic. Yeah, of we've, we've talked a decent amount about this movie too. Um, we uh, yeah, we have. Um, but this movie's place in the history of this franchise to me is just as puzzling yeah. as anything because again, it was a moment where Leatherface could have taken the throne, like for a guy who he's a household name. Uh, I actually disagree with you. I don't think he's very marketable. I think he's actually extremely off-putting to normal moviegoers. Really? Okay. Like, I think he's very popular in the horror community, which we are yeah, both a part of. That's that's sort of what I meant. I, like, he doesn't have as much crossover appeal as, like, a Freddy Krueger, right? Which I, no. is baffling to me because he's a, you know, child murderer. Um, but, I mean, even Michael Myers is pretty profitable. I think I think recent examples, too, like Sam from Trick or Treat, like, that makes sense. He's not quite there, but like, it's not unheard of for you to go out in public and see, you know, uh, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre shirt. You're you're just not, not seeing that from characters of. like you I know, just Art the Clown nowadays, right? He, I mean, he's a guy who wears human skin. For yeah. Uh, he's a cannibal. He kills people with a chainsaw. It's just very off-putting, I think, to the general person. I'm not saying that. It's too off-putting, although some right. some of those movies kind of test that. But there's a reason why they can't make a franchise with Leatherface the way they did with Michael. I don't know anybody who is like kind of off-put by Michael Myers unless he's being directed by Rob Zombie, who or takes his inspiration from Toby Hooper, the great or Joe pro, or, or just well, that's a different <laughs> kind of problem. Yeah. Off putting it a different way. I'm not talking about the quality of the movie. It's just like something that's so um, alienating about about the character. Oh We're god, I can't believe we didn't mention this. Um, it's amazing that this movie didn't do better because it has maybe the best teaser trailer ever made, <laughs> certainly for a horror movie. Yeah, I actually made a video about this when I had my own channel, uh, and I used that teaser trailer in there because it's incredible. It's certainly. Um, I'll say misleading, maybe, for tone. Um, it, the tone of the teaser trailer, for those who haven't seen it, please look it up. Just look up Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 teaser uh, on YouTube. You'll find it. It's very easy. Uh, it is wonderful. Um, I don't want to put it in this video because I don't want to get copyright striked. Uh, I, I don't think we could reasonably put it in there. However, um, watch it, and you will see what I mean. Like it's It's a completely different tone than the movie is. However... It is legendary. I, one of my favorite horror teasers of all time. It's more famous and well liked than the movie. Yes. <laughs> That's an excellent point. I didn't think about that. You're absolutely right. It is more remembered and more talked about. I've seen it shared in horror groups, and then people are like, I didn't know this movie existed. Or, uh, <laughs> oh, I, ha I haven't seen this movie in years. Uh, totally forgot this existed. Um, yeah. It, it, Man, I can't believe we didn't bring that up either at the beginning of this. Like, I didn't even think about it. Uh, but Especially because yes, I know you're a big legend. fan of marketing. Huge fan of marketing. Uh, who, who knows? Maybe that might come up on the channel uh, later as well. But, uh, yeah, it's... So, it's um, Not, not it's exactly related to the movie, but, yeah, I, it, I could not... Related enough. Yeah, it's related. Uh, but I could not bring that up. In a way, I'm almost wondering Cheers. if the marketing kind of hurt because... I don't it's it's not a trailer that gives everything away but it almost feels like a complete experience for some <laughs> it's like its yeah. own short film it's like yeah I'm good I'm good and it's not long either like like the way that like people talk about it it's not like a long teaser trailer it's it's just so complete in itself and it and um it, it deserves to be up there with some of the best horror trailers like ever for me I think it um, definitely is I can't even think of a great. teaser trailer that really competes with it uh although if anybody can uh let us know there's i remember the jason takes manhattan one that was pretty famous yeah um, there, there's some good ones out there you know but uh this one deserves to be in that conversation if the movie doesn't get the respect it deserves damn it give the teaser the respect it deserves <laughs> give this movie something come on people so with that being said um i know i've i've said my piece yeah i feel i feel good I guess we're ready to go into our final verdict. All right, people, the rules are still the same. We have yeah. uh, a four-tier ranking system. You are either 
that bad, not that bad, actually good, or so help you God, you might actually be great. Or if you're Cody Leach, there is a special fifth option <laughs> called actually fucking awesome. And he's so far reserved, the only person. That's that. reserved for him. Yeah. Um, now, I, uh, I'll i go ahead and go first. Um, yeah, since love to hear it. you're the big fan, let's save your word for last. Um, yeah, I, I've alluded to this, but my thoughts on this movie have changed. I was remarkably unimpressed with it the first time I saw it. I thought it was a very sad attempt at turning Leatherface um, a truly singular character, distinguished character into just uh, another Jason Voorhees. Um, and I, I understand why I thought that, but my most recent rewatch uh, made me see a lot of things that I just missed the first time. I saw um, an incredible cast of characters, um, remarkably twisted imagination. Um, it's a very well executed, no pun intended, sequences of mayhem. Um, I particularly like that battle on the lake with the the chainsaw rotating around. Oh yeah. I don't think that's how that works, but I'll forgive it yeah, for that works. movie. Um, <laughs> a number of great characters. It has more good characters than most acclaimed horror movies can boast. Uh, unfortunately, we're saddled with the two worst characters for the majority of the runtime. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to see a sequel to this. I'm not sure if um, I was left hungry for more. Uh, like the best um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, it just felt like a good old sledgehammer to the head, you know? And I had a complete experience with it. I'm satisfied. I have ordered the Blu-ray, which um, there are some movies that I would rank higher than this in this franchise that I uh, would not do so. So I, I have a personal fondness for it, even, even beyond just um, how much I respect it as a movie. So all that being said... Y'all are crazy. A two point what three? Two point three. Get, get out of here. This is <laughs> that, that's crazy. This is actually good for sure. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, I guess it's my turn. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm not uh, not going to stray from the pack here. Uh, this uh, this movie has been one that I've been fond of since my first watch of it. Um, I love you know. Like sometimes the movie has everything going for it before I even put it in, and this movie did. It, it had a a great cover on its uh, on its Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, had an awesome teaser trailer that I saw for it. Um, great branding, great marketing uh, that I saw. Um, it wasn't really marketed heavily back then, but you know nowadays when you go online, you search things up. There's art for it. There's all of these things, and. Um, I think this has some of the one of the coolest looks uh, before you even get into the movie. Once you get into it, I mean, there are things to dislike. There are things we didn't even get to in this episode because there's there's so many things that we wanted to praise. I mean, there's 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 things like the not so good score of the movie, uh, which doesn't stand out at all. Um, not that these movies usually do, but uh, this one's particularly not great. Um, you know, there are uh, the movie is relatively cheap looking at certain points, um, but I think this movie also has really cool cinematography when you can actually see what's going on. Uh, it has the coolest family in my mind, the, the best version of this Sawyer family, despite losing the patriarch uh, that we had in the first movie, uh, which I believe was executed via gas chamber, if we were to believe the opening crawl. I don't know what that opening crawl was about. That's a whole different story. That um, was, <laughs> we would have, this is the one time I wish we had been without an opening crawl, but I, I get it back to you. Um, but this, this also had some of the coolest moments in the franchise. Some of, uh, what I would call the best moments in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, a franchise that I hold dear, uh, in my heart as, as one of my favorite horror franchises, I'd say. So, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, um, when it comes to what I want to give this, I really want to go higher. Um, and I'm going to, uh, this movie, uh, is at the bottom of this category. Uh, but I believe it deserves an actually great. Um, I, I gave bottom I, tier app, uh, actually bottom great tier actually well. great. Yeah. You know, because, because that's still really high, but I, I wouldn't, I, I would say there are movies I've put in actually great, um, that, that don't measure up to this. I would say like, this is, this is better than the actually great that I think I gave Leprechaun three and or Leprechaun four in space. <laughs> You gave Leprechaun Which, 4 an actually great, huh? Uh, I, I don't I remember. Know, I, I gave Leprechaun 2 an actually great. 
I think I gave Leprechaun Returns an actually great, um, and I would probably put these on the same level. I, I have the same level of appreciation. I think they have the same level of charm for me. Obviously, um, there's, you know, a curve. We're grading on right. a curve here. Yes. I mean, this is, if you asked me to compare this to, uh, you know, the lineup for the Academy Awards right. on, on most given years, uh, I would still give it an actually good, to be honest. Yeah, I would probably watch this over a lot of those movies, to be honest with you. Um, no, th this is when I revisit a lot. You, yeah. Um, I revisit this movie a lot. Um, we'll see, you know, at the time you're watching this, either um, our ranking is coming soon or it's already out. Maybe you're coming from the ranking to see our thoughts on this movie extended past, you know, the, the short little blurbs that we give in that. Um, but um, I like this movie a whole lot. I revisit it more than most movies in this franchise. Uh, I, I watch will this say this is, this is actually a time where doing an episode on a movie has, has changed my opinion because I, I only saw it the one time before we decided to do an episode on it in fact you know i know you had wanted to and i just wasn't that interested in revisiting it uh and i don't know why it clicked for me this time um maybe i just didn't have a stick up my ass this time because <laughs> most of my life i'm glad <laughs> i've been a total uh tcm purist like i, I would have it's uh, understandable maybe... I'm, that first movie is 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 legendary levels of acclaim like i, I yeah. know people nowadays are coming around and there's always been the people who eh, it's not for me um but it's it's transcended its franchise i mean it's it's even more so i think than halloween uh it's it's just the movie that stands out the most from the rest of the ones that that came after it uh yeah I whether mean, you think it's the best or not yeah i was about to take a shot at Halloween that I'm not going to do anymore. So I mean, I will uh, kill you if you do. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm joking. No, no, let's no. Uh, wrap this up because Connor yeah. and I have another video to record. So yeah. everybody, <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's part ways. Let's uh, say adios and just remember, just remember, there's roadkill all over Texas, and there's yes. a, a hell of a lot of that is is uh, TCM sequels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and don't forget to, uh, you know, we, we may be different than the last time that we saw all of you, but we still have things to whore out on. Um, of course, we still are on Patreon. Uh, it is patreon.com slash that bad media. That's right. Even our Patreon is different. Our Patreon is going to have a, a wider range of content because we have a wider range of content now. Um, so make sure to check that out. If you really like us, if you want to take our relationship to that next level, baby, you can give us your money and we will love you a long time. Uh, that's all I can really say. We can give you some cool content over there, some exclusives that sometimes we'll unlock the vault. Uh, our last three episodes at the point of recording this one have been Patreon episodes uh, covering the Punisher movies. Uh, I wanted to call it a franchise, but I don't know that you could really call it that. Um, uh, the not really unofficial related. Punisher trilogy. Yeah, the unofficial Punisher trilogy. We covered that. We now, covered. Uh, we discussed again, our Leprechaun movies. But if you're a TCM fan, if you want to hear our thoughts about yeah. uh, the beginning, uh, then that's still right there in the Patreon vault. So there's plenty of yeah. episodes like that. And we will continue recording. Also, we should mention we've also started uploading exclusive clips. Uh, sometimes, you know, we try not to to spill the tea on the main channel, but sometimes we just can't help ourselves. So we actually talked about a recent controversy amongst uh, the creator community yeah. uh, that I'm sure people have heard about. If you want to hear our thoughts about the In Praise of Shadows debacle, uh, we were trying not to be a gossip channel, so we didn't include it here. But for you patrons, you get to hear uh, us, us dish the dirt. Yeah, any anything unrelated that we clip out of the episodes that we think would be fun to just throw up for no reason uh, will be on our Patreon. Yeah. Uh, you can find that link to our Patreon and more on our brand new website, thatbadmedia.com. That's right, our website is different too. But if you have the notthatbadpod.com link saved, guess what? It takes you right to the not that bad section of thatbadmedia.com to show you our entire catalog from season one to season two of Not That Bad. We have a bunch of other content coming. You've seen it a little bit already with the inclusion of It's That Bad, a spinoff of this very show. 
as well as some other cool new content. I know Gabe has a video out recently, uh, Black Sheep Theater episode on Shocker, uh, the West, West Craven classic. <laughs> the West Craven sure, movie. It's a classic. Yeah, um, let's, just, which, uh, let's just call it that. It's really cool new content. We got a lot of stuff coming out. The whole point of That Bad Media is uh, for us to branch out from Not That Bad. Not That Bad is an amazing show. We have so much fun doing it and uh, providing this content every single time that we do it. Um, but we just thought, you know, what better way to help ourselves grow as creators as well as our, our channel with as much great content as we can <laughs> by not limiting ourselves to one show. <laughs> who, who would have thought? What a concept. Um, so, yeah, that's what we've done. We hope you like uh, how everything looks and feels and, uh, and, and moves moving forward. Um, anything you'd like to add before you end this nonsense, Gabe? This unsanctioned buffoonery needs to come to an end. Uh, just to make sure that people also check out uh, our first ranking, we're ranking all of the movies yep. in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. It's not going to be the only time we do this. We plan to do uh, a lot more content. There's a lot of franchises that we have a lot of thoughts on that we're going to get through. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're too, we're too, we're, we are not straying from the pack of annoying white dudes with opinions. So luckily ours oh are Oh my God, and we didn't even freaking mention. The reason we did this actually is because it's the 50th anniversary of the original Turner uh, Turner classic movies Texas Chainsaw Massacre the other TCM oh. yeah yeah what uh, better way to commemorate that special occasion than watching our official ranking of the entire yeah. franchise maybe we'll have some other Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff come out before uh, the year's over we'll see um it, it maybe I don't know we're just feeling we're, we're not playing by the rules anymore so dude, we, dude, this is gonna be we want we hope it's entertaining but boy oh boy is this going to be a clusterfuck for a while <laughs> we just hope you you have fun watching it so uh yeah folks uh, thank you for watching this episode mr tice why don't you leave him why don't you leave him with something to uh to, to take to the bank <laughs> all right y'all y'all this is the most y'allsy i've felt in a while all right y'all this is gabe i don't know who i am anymore okay <laughs> 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 This is formerly not that bad. Now yeah. that bad media signing out. Woo!